Minister, Permanent Secretary, you're very welcome this morning. Um, by way of welcome, obviously, when we originally invited you to the committee today, it was in response to the very serious issue of the Education Authority audit into the SEND statement in process. Um, of course, uh, matters have progressed since then, and we are in the midst of the extremely serious public health challenge relating to COVID-19. I would propose, therefore, that we start with uh, the Department of Education response to coronavirus COVID-19 uh, with presentation from yourselves and questions from the committee, and, if time permits, uh, consider uh, the high-level issues relating to the EA audit of the SEND statement in process, perhaps with an intention to return to that matter in a bit more detail. If so you're content with Chair, that I mean, I, look, I'm, I'm content with any way that the, the, the committee wishes to, to proceed. Okay. Obviously, I mean, in normal times, there would be, and genuinely, obviously, the SEN issue is a very critical issue. Absolutely, yeah. Obviously, I think all of us facing fairly unprecedented times, so I appreciate. But I'm happy to deal, in terms of the time frame, as, as sure. it develops with. Uh, I think your schedule permits you to be here to 11:30 approximately. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Just, again, I'm in the hands of the committee. Yeah. Okay, no problem. But Minister Permsek, thank you very much indeed for coming to the committee today. Um, you don't need me to tell you that there is a degree of confusion and concern amongst schools and parents across Northern Ireland in relation to coronavirus and COVID-19 response. Um, I hope our committee today can approach that matter with leadership in mind and provide as much clarity um, as we can to the situation. So grateful for your uh, attendance here today, Minister, and invite you to present okay, to, the, to the committee. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you to all the committee. Obviously, we're meeting in sort of both very unprecedented times and probably sort of a, a, a critical time, um, not just for those of us in Northern Ireland, but throughout the world. Um, uh, you know, I think for all of us, we will have a, a level of concern and worry as to how this will impact uh, on the entire community. I think all of us are looking in our own minds to friends and family, um, and indeed a fear that before we emerge from this, that probably all of us in some shape or form will be touched upon by this uh, terrible uh, virus. Uh, in terms of the, the approach that we've taken, um, I suppose one of the, the obstacles has tended to be that, and probably continues to be, there's a fluidity of the situation, so that even where advice is able to be passed on, uh, it's not something where, if you like, the department is acting in a silo. We, at times, will be, in terms of even what we can, instructions or information that we can give uh, to schools uh, and other youth settings, um, that we are, at times, then dependent upon uh, very detailed specialist advice from uh, so the medical experts, and particularly the public health agency. There is obviously a uh, desire, particularly on their part, to ensure that anything that is then sent on is, is absolutely 100% accurate, and that level of detail sometimes producing means that, that we're not in a position sometimes to get that information as quickly to schools as, as we would like. Uh, clearly, in terms of the approach that we have taken, um, and I suppose very much the buck stops with me and that I've personally taken, is to ensure that any action that is taken, any advice that is given, is entirely compatible with uh, the expert medical and scientific advice, as I've said, uh, as I've said before. Um, my goal throughout this, I, I suppose at, at secondary level, is to ensure, we'll, we'll come on to some of those issues, that the education of our young people is, is continued to be looked after. I think a range of those practical issues will create sort of um, very big problems at times for the department, but they are all probably overcomable, um, as, and particularly as we move ahead uh, as where we are. Uh, probably the biggest single challenge is obviously the protection of, of public health and public life, and so consequently uh, all steps have tried to be taken which are compatible with that scientific advice, and again, I think it would be irresponsible to move outside uh, that sphere. Now, having said that, I think we're in a fluid uh, situation. Uh, even as we speak, there is work ongoing by some of the scientific advisory people to reassess and to make sure that what we have is, is fit for purpose. That is therefore likely to be a moving situation, which I suppose may limit the amount that I can say directly. 
um, on some of that. Uh, from that point of view, I've always indicated that uh, I don't have a particular doctrine or position which says, you know, this is the right answer, this is the wrong answer. What I have said is I want to be guided entirely by the scientific and, and medical evidence, and I think I will not go take us in a direction which is uh, contrary to that, but I think, as I said, we are in a fluid situation. We've seen this week even in terms of some of the uh, announcements that were made on, on Monday, which will have implications. If we are in a fluid situation, it may well be the basis that uh, if we're looking for uh, further announcements that we can try and wrap up as much together rather than do this on a piecemeal basis. I, I should say, as opposed to maybe in one um, update the committee on one particular aspect, uh, because it's simply arisen this morning. Uh, this morning, the Chief Inspector has written to uh, all schools, and certainly it was something I would welcome, confirming that for the rest of this school term there will be no further inspections or visits by the inspectorate. Uh, and I think, again, that's a very sensible move, and I, I know, I suspect, that many within the, the education settings will, will welcome that. Um, as we move, move forward, obviously there's a number of contingency issues which need to be looked at. Um, it's clear that we will reach a point uh, at which schools will be closed. So there are a number of implications within that. I should say I think we've got to be careful that a narrative is not developed or indeed a misunderstanding that simply saying that schools uh, cease to operate on site means that education stops. That is not the case. And I know that there's been quite a lot of work that's already gone on by schools and in terms of preparation, we've sent out the, the message to them um, no later than, than Monday of this week that they need to be preparing up materials so that when we reach the point at which school closures happen, um, that they are in a position then to carry on with online teaching, have packs for uh, pupils, it's important that, that uh, in this horrific crisis that the people don't miss out on their education uh, and therefore that that preparation um, is done. Uh, very specifically, uh, also there will be an examination, again, I hope to move forward on this. You know, one of the major reasons, I think probably the major reason why uh, the broad advice has been to, to keep schools open at this stage has been... The, the work that is ongoing in terms of, um, you know, th there's, there's different assessments, if you like, of the particular extent and modelling uh, of the spread of the virus, depending upon where children are, uh, where their schools are going. Probably the biggest single factor has been the <laughs> issue of, um, uh, of the impact, if you like, on uh, what parental response will be needed to this. And obviously the particular concern that, uh, that unless something is done uh, which gives levels of, of cover and support, that uh, we would see a denuding of uh, particularly frontline services, emergency services, and particularly in terms of, of health side of it. So there will be ongoing work to establish that even in the event of um, overall school closures, how can we provide some level of cover uh, for those particular set of, of workers. That, some of that will mean then that in terms of provision, for instance, of child care facilities and child of, you know, we may be able to accommodate that in some way and do it in a way which, because the numbers are, are an awful lot smaller than uh, what would be involved in the broader school population, which ensures that we have all the health and safety requirements that will provide the, the protection of social distancing. So that is something which is, is ongoing and will be ramped up in the days ahead. There are also, again, because a lot of these things, as you can probably appreciate, um, and there will be discussions I think, as we speak, which the department is being represented up by senior officials, there is across the executive a civil contingencies group, which involves all the departments, is chaired by the First and Deputy First Minister, and also involves a number of the key services, you know, for example, the ambulance service, uh, PSNI, etc. Um, so a lot of the work that, that has to be done ultimately is one that, that cuts across different departments. Um, as such, I think one area which we are working on with health and communities, again in the position in which um, uh, we reach a point of uh, there being sort of complete shutdown um, of how we deal particularly the issue of free school meals. The issue I think, of getting a warm meal to those who are vulnerable goes well beyond that of children. It is actually the, of how we provide that support 
to vulnerable uh, vulnerable adults. And there has been work that has been ongoing between my officials and other uh, departments on how that can be best um, managed. I think one of the things that people do need to realise that in terms of um, the cost of free school meals, around about two thirds of that is actually for the payment of the, of the workers. Um, it's less than a pound, I think, for the actual food, because you're able to have a volume of scale that would be there. So I know that some people have talked about simply some form of voucher system to, to pay. So I think that wouldn't be particularly practical because it wouldn't, wouldn't cover the money, but that would be dealt with as well on an executive-wide basis. And probably, I think, in terms of the broader area of, of feeding the vulnerable, would probably one where the, the, probably the principal direction of travel will come from the Department of Communities. Uh, in terms of, I suppose, other, other issues that are uh, there, uh, obviously there would be a key concern around examinations. Uh, there has been considerable work, and I think Derek will want to, I suppose, deal with a little bit more detail on that, um, whether I respond to questions or I'll, I'll take him in a minute or two. Um, there has been a good deal of work with CCA on the options in terms of examinations. Obviously, at this stage, the, the, the principal concentration will be on the, the public examinations, particularly GCSE, AS levels, A levels, um, which will then have an impact very directly on, uh, on pupils' future. Uh, clearly, if it's simply an internal examination, that is something that is obviously far less uh, pressing and will not be of particular significance. Um, we are in a good position in Northern Ireland uh, internally because um, we have a situation in which uh, a lot of work, we, we operate the CCA on a linear model, which means that um, uh, there can be levels of assessment. So that gives us a range of options. The, the preferred option, I think, for all of us is that obviously if we were in a position that schools were operating reasonably normally, or indeed the preferred option across the board in terms of examinations, we'd be exams, we'd be able to be held. But I think it's a realisation that may well not be practical. So there are a range of options that are being developed up uh, from CCA. I think one of the slight limitations that we have um, is that, uh, first of all, there will be sections of our examinations market that uh, lie outside of Northern Ireland, so there, and things are not as easy in England, but also actually that these feed in particularly to uh, examination results and a sort of competitive process, particularly at, at A level for universities. Um, throughout the United Kingdom and beyond. And so, therefore, it's critical, I think, CCA are working with the other examination bodies um, and the examinating regulars, regulators and the universities to scope out what options are there, that's something then that can be fairly applicable uh, across the board. Because, again, there's no point in, in a range of our pupils getting particular grades if nobody else is, because there wouldn't be any decisions able to be made at university level. I think Derek has some more, more detail um, on that. Maybe I'll yield to Derek. Is there anything else you want to say on the examination side? No, no I'll, I think that's enough at this stage. Happy to okay. pick up questions. Okay, I, look, I'm sure there's probably something I've forgotten to, to mention at this stage, but I'm sure they'll be picked up um, in terms of questions. Uh, as I said, I would simply reiterate we are in a somewhat both critical situation but also fluid uh, situation. So I'll try and give answers as best we can. but. Uh, as with all these things, I think there's a strong possibility of events being um, overtaken um, very quickly in relation to any responses or any questions that we ask. Okay, thank you, Minister. Thank you, Prime Minister. I'm uh, acutely aware of the need for us collectively to demonstrate leadership in relation to these issues. I'm aware of my role as chair uh, as a, a statutory committee. I want to take a very brief moment just to. Um, state that the separate to my role as chair that the Alliance Party position in relation to the issue this week was to propose and support proposals for engagement with stakeholders and the allocation of time to plan for a phased school closure from Friday the 20th of March. Having said that, I will ensure that my position as chair of this committee today is as chair of this committee and seek to ask questions and, and guide questions from the members as well then. Uh, Minister, in, in that regard, um, can, I, can I start by asking if you know how many schools in Northern Ireland are closed today? Look, again, I think it's 
Sorry, not no. today, because the picture is changing, okay? okay? We can provide that information and we gather that information on a daily basis, but I could give you a figure today and it could be wrong in 10 minutes time. Okay, well, suffice to say, I imagine that we're all aware that it is a reasonably significant number of schools, um, which suggests, objectively speaking, that the attempt to enrol schools in your position with regards to um, a call to follow expert clinical advice um, is diminishing. And so can I give you another opportunity to explain more fully what that expert clinical advice is and why it, it leads you to call for schools to remain open? Okay, as I said, we're in a moving situation where even the expert medical advice, you know, there is further consideration happening that on a, a wider a wider basis. I suppose what has been grounded upon has been, and there are, I suppose, in terms of the tackling the virus, it has been, um, obviously, the different people have different thoughts and views on how best to do that. Um, I've sought, and indeed, through the executive has, has sought to seek the advice directly of the chief medical officer. That is backed up by the public health agency uh, and on a more global basis by the, sorry, a more UK-wide basis on the um, scientific advisory group on um, emergencies. Uh, that advice, I suppose, was and has been uh, that um, and was delineated, I suppose, um, both initially and then on uh, Thursday, whenever the executive had, meet, had met, um, within a few hours of the announcement of the Republic of Ireland, uh, directly by the chief medical officer. His view was that, in terms of interventions, that um, the beneficial impact of any form of school closures could be relatively minimal, and therefore, to some extent, we're down the pecking order of various things that, that uh, should be done, but also that this wasn't the right time to do it. What he talked about was that he wanted the, uh, the right interventions at the right time, making the maximum level of impact. I think the very specific concerns that were raised um, were uh, if you took um, 330,000, well, 340,000 if you include all the, um, the, sort of the preschool children, because I think the other thing that's got to be made clear is that when we reach a point, um, leaving aside what can be specifically done for emergency workers, when we talk about school closures, that is also um, sort of code, if you call it, for both youth settings and also childcare facilities. I mean, it's, it's got to be something that's entirely across the board. So we shouldn't just assume that it's, it's a large part of it. But anyway, the principal concern would be that if you take that number of parents out, uh, you take them out quickly, that at a critical time where those particular responses are needed for the virus, that inevitably two things will happen. Uh, the parental childcare arrangements for a large number of those, those pupils, and the vast bulk of them would require some form of childcare arrangements. Those who would be at the upper echelons of school, some of the later teenagers won't require anybody in with them, but particularly younger children certainly will. Uh, that inevitably would lead to an enormous disruption to the health service, to frontline services, and take quite a large number of um, those workers out of the equation just at a time whenever they needed to be there. The other implication, I think, is that, uh, and this predated as well the advice that, that has emerged then on Monday, um, that in practical terms for a lot of parents, a lot of parents who um, for example, would not simply be able to afford for one of them to be at home, no matter what provision is, is, is made, uh, that a lot of that childcare arrangements then would fall upon grandparents. And we know uh, from the point of view of um, what we've detected from the virus in terms of, in terms of the mortality rates, that those who are um, elderly are the most vulnerable um, to this. And the concern, if you like, was that, that whatever benefits you would have from removing children from each other, at least in a school setting, those would be more than offset by the impact at that stage on uh, those two categories. I think there's also 
again, one of the things which is not, I think, commonly understood and may well have been given an impression by what at least initially has happened to the Republic of Ireland. It is also the case that the, the medical advice would be that if you were looking at uh, school closures, particularly to isolate children, to, to take them out of the equation, this isn't simply a question of, of withdrawing things. And I think even as the Taoiseach said last night, um, you know, you're talking about something that's going to be a very sustained and long-term situation. So if you're going to withdraw, uh, if you're going to withdraw children from school, it will not be on the basis of effectively a, a two-week period and then everything will go back to normal. Uh, realistically, uh, when school closures happen uh, and when children are moved, we are talking about for the rest, of the, the rest of this academic year, which will also then run, as we know, we're due to run into then the summer holidays, which you're actually talking about until the end of August is a very long period of time. So, you know, all those factors, I think, uh, led the Chief Medical Officer to a very clear-cut assessment that, that uh, now has not been the right time uh, to do that, because that's the sort of the, the background on the, the broad sort of scientific quality to that. As I said, a principal concern, well, obviously I've, I'm very concerned about the education of our young people, the principal concern is the assessment of the impact on, on public health. You know, at the end of this, I, I want to be able to... I think all of us want to be in a situation where there will be, it is likely to be a horrendous number of deaths arising out of us. We don't know how much is probably wrong to speculate, but there will be large numbers of deaths. If we can try and keep those in minimum, because every, every individual death is not simply a statistic, it is the impact that that will have on a, on a family. And so therefore I think my overriding duty on the basis of uh, being ensured that, that what is there is compatible with, uh, with what I'm told. Um, is to try and preserve life. But, I mean, like, frankly, there are clearly no easy choices in relation to this, and we are moving in a somewhat fluid environment. OK. There's a, a couple of things I want to follow up on there, Minister. But first, can I seek clarity with regards to why the closure period will need to be for 14 to 16 that, weeks? That is the, the, the clinical advice. If, essentially, um, this will not be a virus which will be eradicated in any very short period of time. If you were, for instance, simply, and I know in the Republic of Ireland they announced essentially a two-week period, I suspect that that will simply have to be extended because, uh, you know, unless you were left with a situation that you'd have fairly, um, and I'm maybe dwelling in areas that I wouldn't have of expertise, but unless you had, at a very early stage of a virus where you had one or two cases and you felt particular action could just eradicate it and you would completely sort of hermetically seal it from the, the future point. I think the clinical advice is that, that like a two-week break isn't really going to do a great deal of good, that if you were to try to genuinely suppress the numbers, it's a much longer period of time. Uh, and so, you know, I've, I've heard talk of three months, I've heard talk of four months, you know, it may even be longer in relation to that. Um, I, I think just the feeling is two weeks, for instance, it would simply be a token gesture. Okay. You do, however, of course, say that there will be school closure and, and it will be for that considerable period of time. You've said that the clinical advice is about uh, deciding on that school closure at the right time. Mm -hmm. Have you any clear indication as to when that right time is going to be? Well, look, I'll have to rely directly on that scientific advice. Look, I think um, one of the things I would say is that uh, it is clear that the spread um, in terms of the modelling would suggest that things are moving quicker uh, than everybody anticipated. Um, I think that will influence levels of, of timing in relation to it, but it is important we make the right interventions at the right, at the right time. I think part of the thing is to ensure you have the maximum impact, and some of that will also be around the modelling of when we can suppress the spike um, to try to ensure then as well, because I think part of the issue as well with this is if we are going to be faced with large numbers of cases, I think particularly from the health service point of view, we, as much as possible, we want to try to um, massage things so that they happen at a time when there's, there's the least pressure on the health service. I think if we were facing a situation, which is not impossible, this could happen, and one of the things we need to guard against, that if, for example, the, the peak point uh, of any virus outbreak happens during the winter periods, that effectively the, the health service will, will fall over. Um, the issue is most particularly in terms of 
the potential mortality rate uh, is not simply as well on the basis of those who die from the virus. But if the, the hospitals are so overwhelmed within that, it will help inevitably have a pretty large knock-on effect on other mortalities. So it will mean that patients will not be able to treat it uh, as quickly. Parents, patients, even with serious conditions, will not be able to get a bed. Um, you know, essentially, there will be people, um, and I think there's a danger of this in, in whatever stage we, we peak, but it's particularly if, if, if the peak is, reaches a wrong period, um, that uh, there are also quite a large number of secondary deaths, things that, that under normal circumstances would be able to be treated, would be able to be cured. I mean, we talk, um, you know, there's talk quite often in, in the medical profession, particularly around heart attacks of the, uh, you know, the golden period at the start, and if you don't get that intervention very quickly, uh, that will lead to deaths. I, I think inevitably, if, if, uh, and I think this will happen to some extent, no matter when things happen, uh, but we want to keep that to a minimum as well. Okay. I suppose at, at this stage of the escalation of UK advice with regards to flattening the curve and with regards to general population working from home and socially distancing where possible, but for at-risk groups, even clearer advice is to socially isolate. Um, can you understand why teachers, parents expect that it ought to be possible to give a clear answer to what that time for closure will be? Yeah, look, I think that's something that uh, there are ongoing discussions on, I think, particularly with the chief medical officers, uh, with the scientific group, which also then feed directly into government. No, look, I understand the frustration. I think the, the problem is that whatever you're doing is going to be entirely condition-led, and therefore um, it's, you know, I think the more precision that can be given, the better. Uh, and I think that uh, where there will be further movement must be on the basis of giving that very clear understanding to people uh, and trying as much as possible to have an overall package of, of, of information. I suppose sometimes trying to get all those aligned to be able to give that is, is sometimes can be difficult. Uh, but certainly as we move ahead, you know, it's a fluid situation. I, I would hope to see um, something which can give a greater level of certainty. I, I entirely understand the frustration. And, you know, the frustration is obviously out there for, and faced by all of us as well. Um, is allied very much with the concern that is there, because this is not a situation where there's just some sort of flu ep epidemic and people are facing being a little bit sick. You know, we're talking about something that is very deadly, to which there is no, there is no cure. Um, fortunately, I think for the vast bulk of people who, who will suffer from this, the, the condition will be relatively mild. But for some, and variants, there are variations in terms of the estimates of this, but for some, this will be a fatal condition. Um, and that is very scary for everybody. I think it's scary, to be honest, it'd be scary for me type of thing in terms of looking to society. And I think it's scary for, for all of us. So, you know, I think the concerns out there are absolutely understandable. I, I completely appreciate that. OK, so let, let's focus on responding to those concerns then. In, in addition to the, the escalation of the UK advice um, affecting concerns around timing, uh, as I said, the advice is for general population to work from home and to socially distance where possible and for at-risk groups to socially isolate. You appreciate that within, that, uh, that within the school population there are many people that are in those at-risk categories, mm -hmm. I think particularly with regard to special school provision, mm -hmm. um, but across uh, the school system. What, what has been and what is your guidance for people within schools that are in the at-risk category that the government has directed to socially isolate that are being required to attend our schools? Today? Well, certainly I think there's nothing that we would say that would be incompatible with that, and I, I bear that in mind. I mentioned, Chair, um, that there's a, a fluid situation I think there will be we've been working as well with PHA on very specific advice um, we're in a fluid situation I would hope to see a situation in which there can be um, there can be wider agreement wider announcements in terms of uh, the way forward in relation to this and I think uh, it's important that uh, that everything is then brought together within that that, that position.
Okay, you meant, I think members will want to probably press you on some of those questions, but you, you mentioned the significance of having childcare arrangements in place, particularly for key health staff. What engagement have you had with the childcare sac sector and what well, plans are being put in place to provide that care? Where, where, I, think, where I think we're looking at in relation to this um, is to look at, I think, while obviously the principal focus will be on, on healthcare, there will be other sectors out there that will require um, some level of protection, uh, you know, go beyond that. I think one of the areas that will need to be scoped out and may well be getting scoped out at the moment is if we move to a situation of that nature, um, what, uh, you know, sort of which other sort of key workers will this will this cover? I think that's one of the things that will be raised at the civil contingencies group to try and try and get some level of assessment from departments. I think we need to assess the numbers that are there. Um, we need to assess then also as part of that the willingness of um, of parents to do that because if, if you had a sort of eligibility requirement, there would be some parents will say, well actually to, to help facilitate me remaining at work as a nurse or a doctor, an ambulance driver, I think this is a key thing that I want to take advantage of. Others may say, well, actually, I have my own arrangements. doesn't need to, to do that. Or alternatively say, well, actually, I still would prefer something, something at home. Um, I suppose part of the issue with that, when I'm talking about childcare, I'm not simply talking about what could be provided for basically the preschool uh, cohort. I think we'll be examining um, to what extent this can be uh, extended. Whenever I'm talking about childcare, I'm also talking about perhaps particular teaching arrangements for some children as well. So it's it's about sort of a mix uh, within that. Um, those are still there's a, there's enormous logistical difficulties, and one of the issues, I suppose, with that, uh, it is difficult until we get a degree of handle on what numbers we're going to be talking about. Uh, we can then start modelling how we provide that that provision. Um, but that's not something that will happen overnight in that regard. I'm keen, I'm sorry, Prime Secretary. Yep. Chair, Chair, I wonder would the committee find it helpful if I just give a brief overview of what's going on in the department? Mm -hmm. I mean, the Minister has dealt with a number of high level policy issues, but just to update the committee okay. uh, before, before questioning. Go ahead. And maybe it will prompt questions. From a departmental perspective, like all government departments, this is now the single issue, and obviously we've invoked our emergency response arrangements. The way that will probably manifest, manifest itself to the committee and other stakeholders is that the day job will cease, and a lot of routine business, nonetheless important business, will stop, and maybe the committee will feel the cold wind of that. but. We will simply be stopping lots of work to create capacity and resource to deal with some of the issues that the committee is concerned about. So, for example, the committee has been briefed on transformation projects. We're just going to suspend those and use the teams to do other work. The bringing forward, for example, of development proposals, really important, high profile. We have good people working in those. They need to be helping us here. And in terms of the big ticket issues, the committee is well aware of them. The minister has mentioned them. From an education perspective, as opposed to a wider public health, there are probably five big ticket issues that are concerning us and we have been working on. Examinations have been mentioned, um, particularly the public examinations, GCSE and A levels. Now, the Council for the Curriculum Examinations and Assessments, SIA, has been working in great detail on scenario planning and how its contingency plans measure against different scenarios right across the spectrum. Um, they do have robust contingency plans in place to deal with disruption, even major disruption to examinations, but we could be moving to something way beyond that. And as the Minister has said, they will need to work with the four other UK or the three other UK bodies and indeed their counterparts in the Republic of Ireland. We do have an advantage in that most of the examinations, 97% at GCSE level, are SIA examinations and within our own control. About 15% at A level are uh, from English or Great Britain awarding bodies. Um, but we're looking at all contingencies there. Got to declare an interest here. The message is 
pupils need to prepare as normal, and I have a 16-year-old whom I don't want to put the books down just yet, so they need to keep working on that. But you could look at a scenario, ultimately, when the whole timetable moves to the right, and we could accommodate that, and then you have to engage with the university sector and the further education sector to change the whole admissions arrangement. That is all doable, but it's uncomfortable. The second big ticket issue the Minister has mentioned is the welfare of children and school meals, but this becomes a wider societal issue. The Minister later today will be getting proposals on options for dealing with that. As we speak, we are engaging with the Department for Communities, the Department of Health, and there are options about mobilising the voluntary and community sectors, which are well organised, to help with the logistical arrangements for getting meals to children, bearing in mind we can't bring lots of children into school settings where school meals are currently delivered, but there are other ways of doing that. And you could look at distribution of funding or vouchers so that people can buy meals and various combinations of that. But it is a huge logistical problem. Another issue is the welfare of children generally. Bear in mind we have in the school system many vulnerable children, at-risk children, and for many of them, their main touchpoint with the system is going to school. And we need to make sure that if schools are closed and they're not coming to school, that those children don't fall through the net. And we're talking to the Department of Health, and it's mainly on the social care side, that those arrangements will be in place. A specific example that was raised with us by a school leader um, on Friday is what if a post-primary pupil is going through a process of school counselling and there is a programme of counselling? We don't want that to be lost. So it's the general welfare of young people. Fourth issue is distance learning and keeping learning going as well as possible. And schools are doing a super job, and I've seen some of the guidance going out, and they are preparing to support distance learning. Be that online, and there are some packages, and EA are trying to ensure that there is capacity in the system, although C2K was not built for this, but there are other packages, Google Classroom, and indeed hard packs going out to pupils. But this will be an ongoing thing. And the final issue is the childcare issue. Now, that is difficult, and as we speak, we are talking to colleagues in the third sector, and we're talking to the Department of Health, seeing how we might be able to provide support to critical workers for the wider economy, and particularly the health and social care sector. So we have teams working on all of these issues as we speak. They're working really, really hard, night and day, weekends. They were working all day yesterday. They're tired, but they're bringing forward potential solutions to ministers. Now, the point that I would make in all of this to the committee, there is no good outcome here. There is no elegant outcome here. There is no positive outcome here. We are in the business of mitigations and least worst outcomes, and everybody needs to realise that. Closing schools does not produce a good outcome for teaching and learning but we're talking about mitigations as best we can, and we will welcome any ideas and any potential solutions that the committee can bring forward on those issues, because we are in unprecedented times and we are developing potential solutions that have never, ever been applied before, so we're in new territory. That's just a bit of context from the Department's perspective, Chair. appreciate that update and appreciate the extent of work that is initiated refer and acknowledge to the modelling that um, has been considered in terms of timing of, of school closure, but in my close of my initial remarks, schools are now closed. Mm -hmm. Childcare is now needed. The modelling to avoid contact with grandparents and sustain access to work for critical workers is now needed. So there is an extreme urgency for full clarity on all these matters. I'll bring in other members. Uh, Catherine Kelly. Uh, thank you for being here today. Um, Minister, I believe that you're contradicting yourself in your earlier remarks when you mentioned um, that there may be a large number of deaths as a result of this virus, but today children are told to go to school. The safety of our children at this time is paramount. It's health before education. and. There, when you talk about classrooms, most classrooms across the north have 35 children at least within their classes. 
in a small classroom with possibly two staff at least? How can social distancing be um, accomplished or practised within an environment such as that? Um, and a few other questions as well, if you want to answer them afterwards. Or okay, no, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll take each of those the comment in relation to that. Look, I understand, I think, uh, one of the issues particularly arising good of Monday will be a high level of confusion when it comes to the issue of social distancing that has been um, raised centrally. Public, you, you know, I completely agree with you, which is why decisions have been taken, that have been taken, that health, uh, you know, important, while I think all of us accept that education is, health comes as the absolute number one priority. Um, the indications given to the Chief Medical Officer and indeed the wider advice is that this is the route which actually preserves the most lives, that is the, the best model. That if you're going to reach a point at which schools get closed, they get closed at the right time. Um, and from that point of view, I can take out of that professional advice and the executive can take that professional advice, and that's the position that the executive as a whole has, has taken, uh, or we can ignore it. Now, that advice, because of changing circumstances, you know, will move on in terms of time. I, I don't have a doctor in our position which says, I, I want to keep schools open, um, you know, full stop in that regard. It's about actually following that advice, and if that advice changes, I'll be more than happy to to alter that, but you're right. Look, I'm doing this on the basis of the professional advice of what is best in terms of the overall health uh, of everybody in that in that regard. So it's it is taken very seriously in that regard, Catherine. Um, what risk assessments, if any, have been carried out across schools to ensure health and safety at well, this time? I know a number of schools have done risk assessments. This is part of the overall position, though, of the uh, in terms of the, the health advice. Uh, that is there. Look, I think uh, I think whenever the permanent secretary put it very well, there is no uh, there is no either perfect solution or indeed good or ideal solution. This is about mitigating. It's about trying to ensure that the overall picture results in the uh, the best possible consequences for public health, or perhaps it's the same, maybe in current circumstances, the least worst. In that regard, so that that is where we've been we've been coming from in relation to that. Um, do, does the department hold a list of staff who have underlying health issues, and how are they being communicated with? We're not the employers in that in that regard, um, and so therefore, ultimately, employers. I mean, I'm not quite sure whether they necessarily hold a list because, again, if you're talking about underlying health conditions, obviously, uh, it will make clear the the direction of travel of what has been been said. Uh, I suppose it's also a question, different people will have different health problems as to whether or not then they fit those particular categories and reach that particular particular level. But we're not the employers, so we don't have a, a full list in terms of the staff side of it. It's not. It's, it's outside our remit in that regard. Well, just another issue to raise, sorry, Chair. Um, <coughs> Education Authority bus drivers um, in Fermanagh and Oma, where I live, um, there's at least 200 of them. Um, half of the bus drivers are men and women over 65. Mm -hmm. They're in a high, the high risk category. They are driving sometimes 55 children um, three or four hours a day um, across from Ananoma. Will there be anything, any advice? Um, well, there, look, the there, will be, there will be as part of, I think, part of the aim of this and working with PHA, working across the, the wider piece, uh, is to try and very soon have something which uh, actually gives a clearer picture right across all the issues on that basis, and clearly that is one of the one of the key concerns in relation. But I suppose rather than ideally try to do something piecemeal, I want to try and bring that together very quickly uh, across the board. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Minister, um, as a, I, I had asked earlier, there are people within the school system who are in the, an at-risk group that have been directed to socially isolate. Uh, do you, you echo that? guidance for them to socially isolate and have you any assessment of what that social isolation impact is on our school? I, I mean, we're, we're receiving communication that there are schools with multiple teaching and non-teaching staff that have been directed to socially no, I, I isolate. And, and look, have you any assessment of from, what impact that has had well, look, on obviously the schools? There's a fairly significant impact. In answer to your first question of, um, yes, clearly I do support the advice that has been given consistently throughout this have said that we need to be guided by mm. 
the direct medical advice, and so therefore I'm not going to pick and choose, if you like, which bits, uh, which bit, which I accept. That will itself have a major impact in terms of the ability to deliver education, and will factor into the uh, wider position, which hopefully will become clearer soon. De Deputy Chair or Permanent Secretary, do you want to come in there? No, no, no. Okay, no, no. Deputy Chair Carnmull. Thank okay. you, Minister and Permanent Secretary, for coming on today. Um, what and what is very challenging times, and um, I know the work that you have been putting on and the department um, are working very, very hard. And thank you for the update. Uh, we are here all to work together mm -hmm. on this, um, and it is our responsibility to do what is best. I won't go over. We are short in time. What I went over on Monday, Peter, I have reached out to you. Know our position. I have also submitted a list of questions, um, and we'll add to them uh, as we go along. But there is a few things that I want to pick up on. Um, uh, I, I suppose have listened to yourself over the last number of days and here this morning. Um, is the executive approach a workforce issue and not a health issue? Because we seem to be talking around we have to prepare, we have to keep children in school to allow uh, frontline staff to still go to work. Well, when talk, Catherine there says about contradiction and putting, sir, sir, we must be putting our frontline staff in danger when we have all these children who are, you know, at school, then coming home to their parents or family members. Um, and then going on, but we seem to keep coming back to you know it, it, health as a priority. But we keep coming back to workforce issue, and then that's back to some of the questions that has already been raised. What directive is the department given to school staff and children with a medical condition, those who are uh, uh, pregnant, those who fall under the category who should be socially isolated? Because Boris Johnson has been clear over the last two two days. Oh, look, oh sorry. No, no, sorry. Go yeah, on no. I suppose that. just to answer those, arguably, I suppose two interrelated questions. No, I think the focus, uh, if I can sort of say, I know there are differences of opinion, certainly particularly on the aspect of uh, the school closure side of things. There are differences of opinion, genuinely held from within the executive. However, I think on the bulk of issues, there's probably a levels of consensus around mm -hmm. some of the others. Look, I think the driver for people coming on on any angle of this is health. In that regard, it just—it's the fact that, and the concern I think that particularly was raised by the chief medical officer that if we move to a situation in which uh, you take particularly the children of, of healthcare workers out of the system, that will have a very detrimental impact on the, the provision that health can make. Which is why moving ahead, that when we reach the situation in which school closures do happen um, officially, and I appreciate that there's a lot of schools have closed, uh, that there will need to be. We are working on special provision to have some level of, of catering of, a, uh, of uh, support um, and care for those who are children of health workers who want to avail of it uh, on that basis. So I think that's, that's critical uh, as well. So in the second point, sorry, I'm doing... Uh, has there been direct... Of, direct oh, yes, yeah, sorry, in terms uh, of the specific... Yeah. <laughs> well, look, we, we've been working... Again, I want to see if this can be wrapped up in a, a wider package, but we've been working with the public health agency who've been drafting advice. You know, it is fairly clear uh, that what we'd be saying to people will be compatible with what has been announced on Monday. So if you're, for instance, a pregnant school teacher, uh, it's clear uh, that the advice is uh, that... Uh, that sort of you, or indeed, a pregnant student as well. Uh, that the advice is they should be self-isolating, so therefore school should not be the place. And similarly, with the range of vulnerable, uh, vulnerable groups and staff. Obviously, there's a little bit of work to be done, just uh, because it was simply referenced to uh, vulnerable conditions. PHA are obviously working then to provide that a clear definition. And I think if we take, for instance, on the issue of uh, pregnancy, as I understand it, is uh, it's. The particular risk is really at, at the time of the third trimester, but I think any advice would be, as has been indicated, would be simply to be anyone who's pregnant. I think, again, if there's no really precautious uh, cautionary approach, we should be taking that where that is compatible with the, the medical advice. So if we're putting people's health first, we need a clear directive coming from the department in relation to protecting staff and children yeah, uh, and who are pregnant. Mm -hmm. and with no, I, I understand. And I, Catherine's I, point on, on no. bus drivers who are on buses today. I, I understand that. And, and Catherine, we've been, we've been working... Um, over 
myself, the Permanent Secretary, and others from the Department, and working, to be fair, with, with an awful lot of work that's being produced from health officials as well. We've been working with them, not simply throughout this period, but to take an example, particularly since Monday night, we've been working over St Patrick's Day with them. There is guidance, I think, being produced by, by PHA. Uh, you know, rightly, they want to ensure that, that everything they have on that is completely right. But I think it's also important that if there's a wider package of, of measures, that can also be included as, as, as part of that as well. But we will certainly be very clear uh, with schools on that issue. As teachers and parents at the moment feel that they're being given different advice <coughs> and uh, they're being told to go to work and to go into classrooms. We talk about the PHA in terms of Catherine raised it and social distancing. It's not possible within a classroom to social, socially distance yourself from children. And then some of the directive that has been given in relation to putting children in the rooms on their own if it's suspected. Um, uh, you know, how do you do that with a four or five year old? I heard last week from special school teachers who don't have a room, don't even have a cupboard to put children in. And I understand that you are working your way through this, but um, you talked about people being frustrated. It's more than frustration, it's real worry and concern. They're listening to the Prime Minister coming on, giving announcements to the nation the last two nights, um, uh, and the Taoiseach in, in the 26 counties given as well. And we seem to be giving conflicting information to schools here in the north. Um, we just want to go back in terms of the, the, the social distancing in schools advice. There's a school in my city, um, and I think you would have seen this, Peter, um, has, been, has a suspected case and has been told they remain open. So what's the directive there for schools? In that? Okay, well, look, I'm not worried the individual case. We can no. certainly pursue it up directly after. after what is session. the directive for if a school has a suspected case, should they close? I think sort of should. we take advice yeah. from the public health agency right. on that. So I mean, I don't want to get into specifics. Right. No. Yes. I don't know what the circumstances are. Well, is not, it a positive any case? School? Is it a, is it a suspected case? It's suspected. Yeah, we take advice from right. the public health agency. If it's a positive on case, should, well then the public health agency will advise as well. Right. That, and we'll take a decision with the education authority and the managing authorities on individual schools. Right. And schools are applying for, you, you know, uh, closures and exceptional closures, and they will all be looked at on their yeah. merits on the basis of the individual cases. Yeah, and um, would you know how many schools have applied for training days to close? Um, I, do, I don't have it as of today. It will so probably be different today than it was yesterday and, or the day before. And clearly, and clearly and however, which, however we move precisely forward, uh, as we move towards the point at which there's school closures, obviously there will be need. I think a lot of schools have availed of the opportunity to uh, do sort of specific preparation. A lot of schools are well ahead. They'll also want to be um, in whatever format is, is moved forward, some level of opportunity then for schools that haven't done that as well to be able to be able to avail of some degree of time as we move forward. That would be part of a wider uh, wider position, I think, which we hope to develop. Yeah. If Board of Governors take a decision to go ahead in schools, will there be closed schools? Will there be any repercussions? Well, Board of Governors don't have... Uh, it, the right will lie doesn't lie with, directly with the Board of Governors, and we will also be in a situation where, across the board, in terms of legislation, you know, there will be a range of things, and I think um, across government there will be actually greater uh, powers being given actually to be able to be able to direct things. That will, you know, I think the other thing we've, we've all got to have a level of flexibility as we move ahead in relation to this as well, which will mean both in terms of flexibility of response, but across the broad public sector. Um, I suppose a microcosm, if you like, of the Department of Education, where we have taken um, quite a number of our staff and redirected them to those very specific aspects. Depending upon how circumstances work out, I think there will be a lot of workers um, that um, you know will need to be in, in different ways redeployed to be able to provide assistance where it's, where it's needed on that, on that basis. Yeah, can I, Minister, can I just check? Do you have the legal power to close schools? We. Well, it, let me put this way. I think, strictly speaking, if if there was a, I think a directive given, I think we don't actually, we we could. The department could issue directions yeah. to schools to do basically anything. But as you are probably aware, there is a coronavirus bill mm -hmm. with a wide range of emergency powers, probably going to be enacted in Westminster very soon which will give government wide powers across all sectors, including the education sector, to issue directives to do just about anything, depending on what the contingency is. 
But just to pick up Ms. Mullins' point there, you know, repercussions for schools. You know, we're in extraordinary times. Yeah. School boards of governors and school leaders act in good faith. Mm -hmm. We know that. Yeah. They are very responsible, concerned individuals, and we are going to be pragmatic with them. Mm -hmm. Now, we can't envisage each and every circumstance, but we are not going to um, take a non-pragmatic approach to this mm -hmm. and get into conflict with school boards of governors and school leaders on this issue. That's my view mm -hmm. as a permanent secretary, and maybe I'm speaking uh, out of turn with the minister. But you know, this is not the time to be running up against people who are doing a very difficult job at the coal face in difficult circumstances, and I understand that. Okay. So you can read yeah. into that what you want. And could also it's it's a main suppose. question that has been asked well, myself. I understand. You know, I mean, it's the one. You can, you know, I, I know there's colleagues sitting behind me here from the mm. teaching unions, and they can read into that what they want yeah. to. I think. I mean, it's also in terms of the bill that's, that's going through across the executive as a whole. Uh, obviously, the normal format of a of a bill will be that sometimes. Uh, there will be particular clauses that apply to Northern Ireland, some that don't, some apply to Scotland, etc. Uh, at least in terms of the opportunity for, and it would then be, if you like, could be triggered in Northern Ireland. Uh, anything which I think across all departments have been asked for to be in the bill and be have the opportunity to be applicable to Northern Ireland um, have been accepted. So I think the full executive position has been accepted uh, from by letters of council. And by government there, that doesn't mean in a range of things necessarily that things will be done, but it means that if something needs to be done, there will not be the uh, the want of authority to be able to do it as, as we move ahead. Yeah, for example, I give you a specific. I don't want to labour the point, but the kinds of powers. If if you needed to, be, to do something drastic to move examination centres around to facilitate GCS, GCSEs and A levels, and maybe pupils doing exams in different locations, we would have the power to direct that to happen. Yeah. It's, it's just to cover every conceivable contingency. Just finally, um, uh, youth centres and childcare settings are saying they're not receiving clear guidance and advice. And I know this is moving by the hour, not even by the day, but just they've contacted as well. If we could get that out. On, on Monday, uh, Minister Wade raised with the, the query around EA staff directive knocking on the schools. Um, uh, and I know that staff are being directed in other areas. Is that as has the department um, also directed their staff not to go, to go on the schools? Is there a separate arrangement for well, school? Well, first staff? of all, as we speak, and um, well, probably the meeting is over now. You know, there's work going on about civil service staff across the board, what to do and what not to do, and it's sort of in the same vein as some of the advice and guidance to teaching and non-teaching staff in the wider education sector. So hopefully, that advice will be consolidated, but. There is no directive, as we stand, about Department of Education staff going into schools or engaging with schools. Now, that said, I've already explained that we're, we're withdrawing from all non-essential work, and that might mean that we're not going near schools. And as the minister mentioned earlier, we have stood down with immediate effect all school inspections. Yeah. However, inspection staff, district inspectors who are out there in the communities um, whilst they will not now be doing inspections, they are more than happy to engage with schools to assist them in the work that they are doing to prepare for distance learning and indeed share good practice across schools, what is happening in one district, what might be applied in another. So we will redeploy them and the full inspectorate will be redeployed to see where it can add value in dealing with all the contingencies that arise, uh, wherever that might be. It is another resource that has been freed up. Thank you. Okay. Robbie Butler. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I'm sure you would join me in, in thanking all of our teachers genuinely for, for, for working in very and, and indeed Robbie, all of our all of our circumstances. staff throughout the education yeah. mm -hmm. system because I suppose I, I, I know obviously some of the teacher unions are, are behind me. Um, I, yeah, I thank very much the work that teachers, principals have done. Obviously that extends to all those who've worked um, both in schools, youth settings, childcare settings, a range of so it's important those who don't. Yeah, I think, uh, we don't I'm, sort of ignore anybody. Now. I think I'm certainly and I have to declare an interest as, as being on the board of governors in a, in a school in this point that very often our teachers and board of governors almost have to carry the role of a, a mini politician with regard to the interface with concerned parents, other stakeholders, other agencies, and the impact that all of these things have. Um, and 
not to, to steal anybody else's phrase, but we are in uncharted territories. And I have sympathy with absolutely everybody and everybody's point of view. And I think the, the reality is that there are no experts in this. The PHA are doing their best. The Chief Medical Officer is doing their best. The, the Minister for Health is doing their best. You're doing your best. And the Minister for the Economy. I actually think our uh, First and Deputy First Minister are also doing their best. Because the reality is, every one of us have children, relatives, who will and are affected. And I think this is the moment where, genuinely, this, this, we have to come together. And I think we are genuinely getting there. So thank you for, for coming here. And I don't envy the position you couldn't be paid enough to, to do and make the decisions that you're making. Um, and I don't think uh, the line of question so far by the committee has been, has been constructive, I think. And I think we're moving very rapidly uh, to the point where some people perhaps know that we're going. But what I would like to, to put on record uh, is thanks for some of the information you've given us today, which I think possibly has been missed. And it's not that it hasn't been there. Sometimes it's accessing the information is the hard bit and no more to, to find it. Because I think the reality is um, that about 12% uh, of our population is children in primary schools. And you've already touched on it, Minister, with regard to the conditions uh, that when you take them out of school, which will have an effect. Um, and not to labour too far, and I will get to a question. I, I, I've said this before, I was once a firefighter. My wife was a nurse. We had two kids who were in primary school age, and the reality w was different then if schools had a close, because coronavirus changes the, the, the playing field because of where they can go. Uh, Minister, my, my question is, uh, centres in and around the executive's approach as opposed to your own approach. And you did talk about uh, civil contingency groups with regard to establishing suitable child mining provision. I think that's going to be absolutely crucial. And I think that's why the, this emergency planning and staged approach is absolutely vital, that we don't crush other sectors of our society, um, whether that's fiscal or social. So the first question is with regard to the direction that the executive group are taking with this. Do you have um, confidence um, that the relevant departmental leads are bringing the, the information with regard to that. It's a wider than education, I get that. You are uh, our Minister for Education, have a voice in there. Um, that that is receiving enough attention. And the reason I'm asking that is because we do have, whilst coronavirus is incredibly important, we have cancer patients, we have uh, people who are suffering from cystic fibrosis, we have people who are requiring urgent surgical attention, um, we have a, a wider uh, societal wheel that needs to keep turning which is need going to be underpinned because those people are going to need suitable measures for, for, for not only looking after their children but protecting their children. So in terms of the executive's approach to that, would you be satisfied? Well, look, look I think the executive, again, while there may be some difference of opinion, I think there's, a, there's clear work going on to try and pull a lot together. I suppose from the point of view of, so there's no confusion on the, the subject, uh, you know, we're looking at what can then be provided in terms of those emergency um, workers uh, I think there are a range of, of actions. There's a lot of logistical work that will need to be done. I suppose very specifically, I mentioned the civil contingency group as probably being the best vehicle for this. Part of that will be establishing um, which group of workers this applies to. Now, there are obviously a wide range of, of frontline hospital staff um, who are key to, to getting that element of things, but there are other things, and I think the aim will be to try to get each department to identify that. The civil contingency group... Um, met, I think, for the first time last week. It was meeting literally as we speak. Uh, now, I've, had I not been, uh, Derek and myself not been here, we'd have been at it, but there are senior officials from the Department of Education uh, who will be there. And that will contain not simply the department, but also certain, the departments, but a few arm's length bodies as well that would be particularly relevant. I think part of the aspect is it is pretty obvious you can identify a range of groups who they should obviously apply to. Are there other groups that, we're, that are not being thought of? We need to make sure that we've got a holistic picture. I think there will then need to be a level of exercise done to establish, um, if you like, from the point of view of parents, who would have um, applicable children in that regard, because you know, not everybody clearly in, uh, in that emergency situation, or you know, if you take yourself as an example, had you been a few years ago, this would have applied to you, it doesn't apply now, and also then establish then if there is a level of demand, what that level of demand will be, and that will then sort of be tailored. And I think civil community group is, I suppose, is the one particular aspect 
would be to send the message out to each of the departments of can you identify which particular groups uh, that are that are there. Mm -hmm. no, no, thank you for that. I think it's really important. There's one. I mean. That the information is, is arriving almost that by the time we go out of here, something yeah. will yeah, I mean, be there, I mean, obviously, yeah, that's right. I mean, there may well be some developments that, that all of us are just sitting here. We're not. I know, but just un but unfortunately, that and, and when, when Boris gave a speech the other night, almost instantly, businesses, some businesses closed, and certainly in the Wynn Lagan Valley and Lisbon, some um, nursery provision and some daycare centres either are on the verge of turning the key to close their doors or are, are certainly thinking and there's some huge investment that some people have made in that and I think in that civil contingencies part that, that's a piece of the part of the jigsaw I think it perhaps is. for um, um, and I'm, I'm keen to point out that we all recognize that teachers aren't childminders and that they play a, a different function um, with, there was there was a bit of information that was shared earlier with regard to food poverty and and the, and the, the and you touched on the counselling piece, and I think I'm just interested to know, in terms of the, we've been talking a lot about mental health, and the reality is that social isolation, yeah. uh, one of yeah. the yeah. one of the most significant um, negative, uh, unintended consequences, mm. is going to be perhaps a spike in an already um, giant atmosphere of poor mental health across uh, Northern Ireland. And this has a, uh, we have to think about this. Um, has there been any thought with regard to not just the counselling piece, but also the contact piece even? Yeah, um, I mean, there, there, right. there, there has been some thought and some work ongoing. I mean, I think part of the stuff is, and again, look, I think part of the stuff when we talked about as well, there's no, we're trying to mitigate, but there's no ideal solution. I think probably sometimes you're trying to solve things that sometimes will take you in different directions. And so part of stuff is you want to have as little contact as possible, but then you try to get now. There are very major problems beyond simply the education piece. Yeah. There will be very major problems out there um, because of the need for levels of isolation. You know, I, I know the police have expressed concern that while, if you like, if, if the streets are empty, there may be less sort of on-street crime type uh, situation. But there's a real danger that we're going to see domestic violence go through the roof. Um, families, as well, that are, are closely confined with each other will be... And that will produce threats for, for children as well. And a whole range of, of issues. I mean, you're right in terms of social isolation. Um, I suppose looking at the other end of the spectrum in that, in that basis. Uh, can I, can oh, I just add? I mean, it, it brings us back to this point that there's no good outcome to no. schools closing. Uh, young people going to school every day, apart from the benefits of learning, it's the social contact, yeah. it's mm -hmm. the friendship, it's the extracurricular activities that schools do a fantastic job in, it's the sport, the music, the art, everything that goes on in school trips, that will stop and there is no way around that if we're mm -hmm. talking about isolation and that will be lost and that's a, that's a real worry. But you know what, for the life of me sitting here right now, I can't see a sensible mitigation to that right now if we're into major social, social social isolation and as a society we're just going to have to deal with that somehow and it is a real worry so I'm afraid that sounds like a bit of a council of despair but it's one of the really negative consequences I mean, if, of if school you, if, if you take a look which also then will have some level of impact particularly on, on children as well if you take a look for instance at the social isolation that the elderly will face many of whom will be in a situation where effectively they're sort of confined to their homes and in a situation where deprived probably of their families in that, in that regard. Now, if you take a look, that is obviously the major impact from a social isolation point of view for the elderly. If you look at it the other way from the point of view of children who may have a very close relationship with their grandparents mm -hmm. but are actually more or less uh, kept, um, not even so much at arm's length, even well beyond that, are not able to, to visit them. Um, you know, children who will not be able to visit relatives, say, in nursing homes or whatever, because they may well be in lockdown. There's, there's a whole range. I mean, there is uh, a tsunami of, of, of major problems that society is, is going to be facing as a result of this. And some of them will be the very tangible things. Some of them will be a lot more intangible. And I think, um, you know, the storm is yet to come, I think. It's just okay. Can one, I, one, can, just, I'll let you come back and just intervene as well, though, Robbie. Let, let's not sell short the innovative ability of our teaching and non-teaching staff to respond to that challenge. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we're all already no, I, witnessing I, multiple online learning, learning fora and, think, and I, suggestions I, that are coming right. forward I think, with regards to child education and good physical and mental health activity during this time. So there, 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 there is scope for mm -hmm. constructive response to those You're right. And I think, I think probably to, to yeah. some extent, yeah, while we're going to be realistic and 
put in place sort of where um, where there are things that are not a, not possible to mitigate some of the problems that are going to be there and be honest about those. You know, I, I think you're right in terms. Of, I think it's also got to take a positive as well that that you know a crisis of this nature brings out sometimes the worst in some people, but also <coughs> brings out the uh, the best in people, and also can create a situation where some of the most innovative thinking arises out of that as well. And I think. We've got to try and capture all of that. Robbie, you want to come back? Thank you, Chair. I've got one question. I'm just going to finish that point out um, because I, do, I think this is really important, and we've, we've discussed it now. We were discussing it in 2016 when we had an assembly, then with three years of political failure, which is, hasn't helped us be ready, battle ready, shall we say? Um, socially deprived areas, um, with regard to, we talked about it in the food poverty, but and that the eyes is on that, but also that's where, where mental health is. Is even worse, and, and I'm not going to. Uh, I, I agree with the chair up to the point of the fact that actually uh, uh, social media is brilliant and using technology is great, but some in the socially deprived areas, perhaps those are the people who are going to have less uh, availability of iPads, telephones, and, and broadband and stuff. So we have to factor this in, and I think it's an executive response, by the way. And, and the point I just want to make is there have been commitments made by the executive with regard to their mental health group. I would like to. I would like to hope that that group. Is considering that at the moment, and that you'll be playing your part, Minister. And the final question then is with regard to teachers. Um, Fourteen weeks from now, roughly, takes us up to the summer holidays, and then we have um, two, two months summer holidays. And I just would like Minister to give uh, confidence and comfort to teachers that, with regard to any time lost, um, with regard to uh, any extended periods, that it doesn't affect their, in terms of their pay, their contributions, their yeah. pensions, and no, things I mean, all, like that. All those, all those aspects, and I suppose again that level of confidence of anybody within the system who is. You know, in terms of teachers, in terms of other members of staff, the, the pay continues in relation to that. Now, obviously, the flip side of that will be in terms of teaching that the teaching will carry on yeah. on that basis, albeit in a different a different form um, on that basis on it. But uh, no, there will be no no disruption in terms of continuity of service. There will be no disruption in terms of um, the financial aspects of things. You know, so I, I give that assurance. Yeah. But again, beyond simply teachers. That are, how, how does that apply to non-permanent teaching and non-teaching staff, such as substitute teachers, for example? Well, if substitution, I think, whenever they're, um, you know, if they're carrying on with the teaching side of it, they'll, they'll continue to be paid on that on that basis. I mean, I think it may well, and again, depending on circumstances, um, for those who are, for instance, on substitute lists, in some cases it will restrict opportunities, in other cases it will actually yeah. expand them. The overriding objective in all of this, Chair, will be fairness to all staff, mm -hmm. um, and that staff are not unfairly penalised because of circumstances beyond mm -hmm. their control, and we look at all yeah. of those. Okay. Robbie touched on contingency planning. Minister, you mentioned a, a COVID-19 group that had, you had established for contingency planning. Can I ask uh, who sits on that group? Well, there's, there's two groups we've been, we've been looking at. The, myself and the senior staff have met as a group also involving particularly directly the CCA. But additionally, uh, the Permanent Secretary, we have established a group which involves representatives of each of the sectors, um, education sectors, plus also the Education Authority, CCA, so that those people around those are meeting regularly as well. Yeah, Chair, um, a group involving all of the, st the main statutory partners and indeed our non-statutory partners in the sectoral bodies. Um, to share ideas, to identify issues, and I have to say, well, the first meeting of the group was on Friday. It was really useful to hear um, uh, colleagues from the different sectors suggest things that we need to look at and suggest ideas for dealing with those. So that will meet regularly, and that's in addition to the internal um, business contingency arrangements in the department. Um, can I just say? Colleagues, again, sitting behind, I know our trade union colleagues uh, would like to have a seat at that table, and I have no mm. difficulty with that mm. whatsoever because we need uh, input from colleagues who are at the cold face too. And uh, I want to talk to um, our trade union colleagues about ideas, suggestions, and how they can continue to help us with their input. I'm sure they would welcome that and perhaps ask why they weren't there sooner. Um, we convened. We convened the first meeting at really, really short notice, and it was a be there or be square. It was convened within okay. less than a few hours, chair, and it wasn't possible to get everybody who should have been there round the table. So it's just I, the speed okay. at which we're moving. Can I ask issue. if there is representation of special schools at that group? 
Um, well, we don't have a sectoral body for special schools, but given that all special schools are uh, come under the control of the Education Authority, the Education Authority is there, and there are lots of representation there. Um, we don't have separate representation from primary schools or post-primary schools or special schools, but we have all the managing authorities round the table, including non-statutory bodies like the Governing Bodies Association. Can I make a suggestion, given that you did ask for suggestions earlier? There is a, a special schools strategic leadership group. Um, get, if you need me to make a stronger case for their inclusion in this, you you will be aware of the lack of confidence in the Education Authority with regards to the representation of special educational needs, and I would strongly encourage you to include the Special School Strategic <coughs> Leadership Group in that planning group, um, and also not least because of the significant amount of special schools pupils that most likely find themselves, as it stands today, in an at-risk category for social isolation. Is that thank, possible? Thank, I can see no reason why it is okay. impossible. Thank you for that suggestion. Not, one other suggestion would be um, we have established and Department of Education official Cathy Galway has engaged um, intensively with it, an all-party working group on, on early education and child care. It has extensive representation across child care provision. I would suggest engagement early, urgent engagement with representatives from that collection of bodies as, as a matter of urgency and be happy to assist with that if indeed that is useful given the centrality I think, I think of child care provision. That's, that's to already this. happened. It's there. happened. That's super. That's great. Okay. Um, can I bring in Justin McNulty then? Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Minister and Permanent Secretary, for coming before committee. I know you are uh, under huge pressure, and um, so thank you for taking the time for coming today. I also want to applaud, applaud the um, principals, teachers, and teachers' unions for taking a measured approach to this crisis and trying to act as one, which I think is, is uh, very important in the midst of this crisis. The UK government <coughs> have adopted a different approach to the rest of the world, and contrary to the World Health Organization rec recommendations. Experts who have experience in Wuhan and China and in Italy are saying adherence to this herd immunity approach is reckless and is going to cause lives. The whole world is social distancing and you're telling us it's okay to pack hundreds of thousands of school children's classes into 30 by 30 classrooms, recognising that children are vectors. We know that children will probably survive and will be able to cope with this virus if, if, if they get it. Um, but it's about more than them, it's about the vulnerable people they come into contact with on a daily basis, be it parents or grandparents. Expert medical and scientific advice and how, 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 can we've, how can that be so different between cross Blaine and Castle Blaine? I've, I've asked that to Minister before, and please don't tell me that's the same as between Lauren and Stranraer. It's clear that the UK government is making decisions in accordance with school terms in Britain, which are different to the school terms here. Can you give some clarity around that it matter? No, I, principal. School, pr school, school terms are largely speaking. I mean, there may be a slight variation on the odd day here and there, but they're broadly speaking, the same. Yeah, I mean, the, the one issue, just suppose, is that in particular in England, the, the school term moves a little bit into into July. Um, uh, but broadly speaking, you know, the same general format of uh, like a call it sort of autumn winter term. Spring term up to Easter, and then a but the time between are Easter and, and my understanding is the times are, are quite significantly different no, in terms of start know. dates and finish dates for school terms. Not, not to any great significant level. I would, I would have thought in relation, and I don't, I don't think uh, that that you know whether I don't know for the sake of argument that that in 2020, um, you know, school started on the. The fifth of January here, and started the sixth of January somewhere else. I mean, the, the reality is actually there's a little bit of variation, even in terms of school dates, and, uh, a little bit of flexibility. Sometimes the frustration of parents, um, even between schools here in that regard. So there isn't a significant um, any level of significant difference. I, I'm not quite sure how that. I mean, the only issue that potentially would play into, as we move ahead, would be what some of the scenario planning around A levels, um, because depending upon what approach is taken to public examinations. But out, outside of that, I don't think any of the term dates has any particular bearing on um, any thinking in, in, in relation okay, well, to that. Okay, well, they to be corrected on that, uh, Minister, but my understanding is that the school terms are significantly different in uh, the north and across the water. 
Um, well, I mean, no, presumably uh, term, terms will be yeah different between Northern Ireland and the rest of the world. There'll be a wide range of, 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 of different dates. But again, I'm, I'm not sure there's a particular the term dates are particularly in any way significant in terms of the timing of this. Okay. Um, principals, teachers, parents, they are already voting with their feet. The tea shock last night spoke about the calm before the storm. The storm is coming. In the throes of this crisis, when we've already lost discipline, when we're already not conforming with, with direction being given from our leaders, our ministers, our, our, our first minister, deputy first minister, if that's happening already, when the storm arrives and we have lost that discipline, we've lost that conformity of behaviour and calm, that discipline cannot be reinstated. So I think that's a consideration that needs to be thought about. Um, we need social obedience as opposed to social disobedience, which can be impacted by these decisions around school closures. Five teaching unions are imploring you to close. They recognise that this is a public health emergency and they would hope that you would hear them on that. Parents should not be left thinking that they have to make a judgement call knowing that they have a vulnerable child at home or have a vulnerable adult or um, grandparents around home. It needs to be called this week. Teachers need time alone in their classrooms to prepare lesson plans, book work for offline and online lessons away from school for their pupils. Schools have been empty now for a number of days, which means that schools are most likely safe places and teachers who may have vulnerable conditions, may have vulnerabilities, feel safe going to that school if they remain closed. That's a very important consideration. As of next Monday, staff will not be turning up. Pregnant mothers, we've heard mentioned already, vulnerable teachers, maybe vulnerable uh, staff members, they will not be turned up. What sort of chaos will ensue because of that? Have you any faith in the UK government's PHA modelling, given it appears to be out of sync with the rest of the world? And who are you putting at risk by following the advice forthcoming from that modelling? I understand the, the childcare issues, the special needs children issues, the school meals, exams, are all massive considerations. And there will be no perfect solutions. I know, Permanent Secretary, you've said that there is no good outcome. Um, but there is a good outcome to school, schools closing. There's a good outcome to schools closing if it saves lives. We've got to factor in, we've got to put in place a plan that factors in bringing out the best in people. And we can only achieve that by calmness, <coughs> by adopting a, a universal approach across this island, I believe in firmly. The GA have already exhibited that by um, opening up Coal Park or HQ to drive through test for a drive through test facility, but we need, I think we need calmness and a uniformity of approach across this island. And that's what people are crying out from, from my perspective. Okay, I think that's I think that was an exam question. What did we discuss in that there's regard? A few, there's um, a few questions. There are there are a few Go questions ahead, in there. I mean, I suppose maybe to pick up. I, look, I agree with you in terms of calmness. I think that has not always been particularly displayed. Unfortunately, not all elected representatives have acted yeah, always yeah. entirely responsibly as, as well in relation to that. Um, you're right in terms of preparation time, and I think in terms of when we move to the point where schools will close, will, and a number of schools have used some of this already. There will need to be specific preparation time for teachers and. Uh, to be able to operate within schools to prepare up some of those. I think, I think that's without, um, without prejudice. Look, I, I've made the point, first of all, I don't have any particular doctrine or view over uh, where we follow. You say, there's, you say there are good outcomes. I think any outcome which is pursued is not wholly watertight. Any op uh, option that is pursued will have negatives as well as positives. It's a question of where you see the balance uh, within that. And to say, for example, simply if you close schools, there, that, that is simply a positive outcome, which is no, um, which is entirely risk-free. No, there are there are downsides to doing that. And it's a question of working out where the balance lies within those. Um, you mentioned uh, the issue of herd immunity. Now, to be fair, I think even to the UK government, I don't think that's been anything that has ever been used by that. It's not something which in any way motivates or indeed is a view that would be shared uh, by the executive or myself in that regard. The specific decisions that have been taken have been taken on the basis of the advice of the, of the chief medical officer. The chief medical officer will be in close liaison with um, 
uh, his counterparts both within the UK and within the Republic of Ireland. And I've also said that if the Chief Medical Officer had made a recommendation which puts us in a different place to where, uh, what is happening in London or Cardiff or Edinburgh or Dublin, you know, I don't really care in one sense whether we are, for any political reason, in step with anybody or not in step with anybody. I would take the very professional advice that is there from our own experts and to try to make that, that compatible. It, it is, as I said, about trying to take the best decisions which actually ultimately um, save lives. Um, as I said, we're in a fluid situation, so advice uh, you know, in terms of what the, the best balance of those things I'm sure will be changing. And <clears throat> I will move um, with that. I think it is important also that as much certainty is given to people and as much preparation time is also given as well. That's got to be based upon the conditions that, that are there. But that's what we'll be seeking to do across the board as we, we move ahead. I can't remember whether that was all the questions you, you asked. But Conscious, we're okay. almost out of time. But Justin, if you want a brief supplementary, happy to bring you back in there. And then we've got William and I should say, sorry, as well. I mean, look, the other thing as well, different governments have taken di slightly different approaches throughout the world. They've done different measures at different times. There are different things that, on either side of borders. So I think it is... It would be erroneous um, to make a view of saying UK doing one thing, rest of the world doing another. And I think that's um, again probably taking this into a slightly pejorative uh, position in, in, in relation to that. There are different ones, and look, uh, we can only go on the best belief of advice that it, that is got. Um, when all this is over, I think people will look back and say it. it's not simply a question as well. One of the things we also got to be very careful of is not something which takes a, a short term. Um, even sort of reduction, which and think that that will be the end thing. I mean, there are dangers of this virus that we see second and third waves within that, and all those factors have got to be taken into account in terms of, of what actions are taken and when, when they're taken to try to, to save as many lives as possible. That's very clear. Okay, William Humphrey. Thanks, Chairman. Thank you both very much for your time today, because I'm, I'm aware that you're both hugely busy and you're working in the most difficult of circumstances, and I want to thank you both for the leadership that you're giving. Um, I'm reassured somewhat to hear that decisions that are being taken are being taken on medical and scientific advice from professional experts. Uh, I think that's important. We have more experts around this issue, issue than we had around Brexit. Uh, if we go by social media and uh, uh, media, indeed, uh, decisions should not be taken by political dogma uh, or by politicians trying to grab headlines. The one thing I would say is that the clarity of message is absolutely important and the consistency of that message. So mixed messages are highly dangerous and grossly irresponsible. And I have absolutely no time for anyone, politicians or anyone else, who cannot stick to a message and because that is so irresponsible in the circumstances in which we find ourselves today. Derek, can I just ask, in terms of what you talked about earlier, in terms of the community sector. Mm -hmm. I had some phone calls yesterday from people who are working in the community sector in terms of jobs and projects and so on, about the fear of their continuation uh, and roles and whatever and the, and the threats that there are to the community sector. In fact, I'm going to a meeting this afternoon around some of those issues. Can I ask you to expand on how those people might be deployed? Or if you can't do it today, if you could maybe make us aware of how those people yeah. might be deployed in the sort of work you were talking about to, to alleviate problems, yeah. pressures? Yeah. Um, I probably can't go into detail because I haven't seen the detail, okay. so it's conceptual at this stage. But you're absolutely right. There, there, there are um, particular areas of Northern Ireland, well, probably right across Northern Ireland, the community and voluntary sectors are very strong. We have a strong voluntary and community sector. There are people working in specific communities who have resources, who can reach out to vulnerable people and reach out to vulnerable families. And you know that best in your own constituency. And we do work with some of those organisations in the wider educational field. So, for example, um, could we envisage a situation where meals are prepared? Um, at a central location, but we could use voluntary and community groups that reach out to individual families to distribute those rather than bringing large numbers of young people to one location. And we're looking at those options. So that is one model. Now, we have just heard overnight uh, about additional funding which will be available to the executive. So, you know, I don't want to put a bid in just yet, but as we speak, all departments are looking at how they could use additional funding, if they had it, 
to fund various mechanisms. As the Minister has said, the school meals issue is an interesting one. Most of the funding goes on the staff who prepare and distribute those school meals. Now, we do not want to disadvantage those, so it isn't just a case of taking all the money spent on the school meal service and giving it to another group. Um, we could only take a portion, a small portion of that money if we want to preserve the uh, security of those staff. So if there's additional money available, who knows, we might be able to give it to organisations to mobilise to deliver school meals at a local community level. That's only one option. I heard a school principal on last night about, um, and you know, I'm sure colleagues behind saw that, where schools could actually continue to provide school meals, but um, bring very small numbers of pupils in to access school meals based on a social isolation approach. I don't know whether that's practical, but we need to look at all of those. Yeah. Well, I just am aware you know, my own constituency, sports clubs, football teams yeah. and so on, who are doing work yeah. and uh, flute bands and so on <coughs> as well. Can I just ask that in terms of, Minister, you've said in terms of uh, schools, as the First Minister has said in terms of schools, that it's not if they'll close, it's when they'll close. Um, and listening to what you said earlier, in terms of, I think the key thing here, I was speaking to the principal and I declare an interest as a governor in two schools. I was speaking to the principal uh, of a uh, secondary school in North Belfast the other night who rang me. I think preparation is key to that, time is key to that. Okay. Um, we, we need to, these people need to prepare for um, uh, the, the, you know, the, the um, education or, or whatever might unfold and circumstances will be different across Northern Ireland. So in terms of the teachers and the staff, in terms of the parents, in terms of child care and child minding and all of that, time is of the essence in terms of that preparation. Mm. It can't be something which is announced one day. No. And if and it comes in no, the next I, day, so I, could you expand on no, that? No, I think look, I think there's two two aspects to that in terms of the way that things would be would be phased when we reach that point, whenever they the evidence are there's got to be, a, as you said, it can't simply be a situation where um, you announce one day the school closes the next. You need some level of lead-in time, particularly for parents, initially in that regard, to be able to, uh, you know, make their own arrangements. Now, I've, I've indicated on a number of occasions that, that parents do need to be thinking ahead, but uh, even with that, I think people, uh, parents do need to actually put in particular uh, care arrangements. You know, I know. So I suppose speaking personally as somebody who's, uh, who's a care of, of knowing that you, it's not something you can actually then just adjust at the drop of a hat in that regard. So there's got to be a little preparation at that time. I suppose the second phase within that, and I think you can sequence these things, is to reach a point at which there is the, the, uh, the end of, if you like, of pupils going into the school as part of that uh, closure, but, but also then allowing additional time beyond that uh, for the... Uh, the staff, the teachers, to be basically adding to their preparation in terms of lesson plans, in terms of, you know, and whether that's through uh, staff development or school development or the, um, uh, you know, exceptional closure side of things on it. Again, there'll be a bit of sense of flexibility. So it's, it's kind of two buffers before you reach the point where, in, if you could sort of say officially, the, the school is closed. Um, and also, as was arising out of that, there would also then need to be a look at uh, what we do in terms of the broader teaching and care arrangements for um, those children, particularly mentioned in terms of the emergency services, so that would be something that would then happen subsequently uh, to that. I think it's, it's best that we disaggregate the, the process a little bit in that, in that regard. So, yeah, I think there's, like, there's, there's roots around, around yeah. that. And, and just one point, and it's actually picking up a point that Mr McNulty made. Um, even if schools were to close, it's not the case that we put a big chain round the school yeah. gate and they don't exist anymore. We still have teachers who are being paid, and schools are not inherently unsafe places. Mm -hmm. So whatever about the preparation time, which is really important, and I accept mm -hmm. your point entirely, um, there is a continuum here whereby you know teachers can maybe engage in how best to facilitate uh, distance learning, and I'd be really keen to engage you know, with our trade union colleagues mm -hmm. about what is possible in that space, what can be done on an ongoing basis over the week. So it's not everything has to be done by day one, and it's an ongoing thing. Could you just, Chair, as well, um, pay tribute to governors, principals, Absolutely. teachers and staff across the education sector for the tremendous leadership, dedication and commitment they're showing uh, to the young people in their care at this time. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Rob Newton. Uh, thank you, Chair. And, uh, 
again echo uh, words of William. I really appreciate Peter taking his time and, and Mr. Baker, I can only imagine the pressure that you're under uh, at the moment. So uh, thank you for coming along today. I, I, I do think, you know, it has been said already, but I, if we are to succeed in this position, I was nearly going to say win, but I don't think there are any winners out of this situation, but we do need a united approach right across all sectors of education and all political sectors if we are going to 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 succeed in this. I, I would, just a couple of minor questions, uh, I would make a plea if we can, because I know some schools in my own constituency who have been doing excellent work in around pupils who are finding it difficult with the school life. Uh, and if we can maybe, in this very difficult situation, um, pay some attention to how we might support those children who are getting support in school at the moment, but in this new evolving situation. Uh, so that, and I would use uh, your, your own uh, words, uh, Mr. Baker, that they don't fall through the cracks. Uh, I think that, that that would be important. Could I just ask you, uh, at this stage, what would you think, as we move into this period and when schools do close, what will actually, can you give a sort of description of what activity would be like over that period until we're back to normal? Uh, education I, I, think, I think, Robin, the, the position particularly as regards would be to try to ensure um, that the teaching and learning continues on, which is why in terms of some of the packs that will be available in terms of some of the online resource, and I suppose one of the other things I think, uh, I know Robin earlier on mentioned about the, um, uh, the issue of particularly, say, within deprived communities, not having maybe the access to uh, uh, sometimes those things. It's also the case, suppose, particularly with some of the internet resources, and I know um, from my 45 minute stint as, as economy minister the other week, uh, there's obviously major concern that particularly in some uh, rural areas in the west of the province in terms of broadband issues. So uh, the provision that will, schools will be looking at this, I think, in terms of a cocktail of, of provision uh, in terms of the logistics of that. But the aim would be to effectively carry on as, as best as possible the, um, uh, the online teaching and indeed the, uh, the curriculum. Obviously, I suppose, one of the areas which will fairly inevitably be highly, if not entirely restricted, will also be certain practical classes which would involve, um, you know, which simply can't be done at home, simply, you know, will not be able to be fulfilled in that regard. So, you know, it, it has to be something which is fairly adaptable in that, in that context, but we want to ensure that children don't miss out, even if it's for a few months, in terms of their, their education as much as possible. Okay. Uh, and when it comes to the awarding body making their decisions on examination results and mm -hmm. so on, I imagine, uh, I'm, I'm going to say this, tell me if I'm wrong, we may not meet the criteria as well for an, an A, a B or a C or a D. You know. Well, I, I, think, I, think, I think to be fair, CCA have done quite a bit of, bit of work in this. Look, I think if you have a situation, and there are a range of options which are being pursued, and some of this will be determined by the, the timing, if you have an option where, for example, physical exams were not able to be taking place, and uh, there are other ways of, of doing that, you know, can you have methodology which is absolutely as robust as simply doing an exam? No, I think probably there's an argument you couldn't, but I think there is a reasonable level of confidence because this is on a much smaller scale something which happens to people's already. There can be a range of reasons why people can't sit particular exam. So it, it's not as if we're entirely un, uncharted waters there. Um, as I said, one of, as both Derek and myself have indicated, I think one of the particular issues as regards that will be how we are compatible with the wider um, UK sort of qualifying system in terms of awarding bodies. I think it's clear that whatever methodology is eventually reached, I think the universities are in a good place to say that they will accommodate and recognise it will not be a question of CCA or any other body saying, well, here's what we're doing, and this is then not going to be recognised by a particular university, I think. Yeah. But it'll be part of a wider wider picture, and we're going to obviously get yeah. consistency across that. And I would just add one point to that, Mr Newton. Um, in its contingency planning for what may happen 
The overriding objective of SIA is fairness to pupils, and that is shared right across the United Kingdom. And I suspect the decisions, whilst what happens locally will be taken by the Minister for Education, it will be a joint decision right across the uh, four countries, four UK countries, and the respective education ministers. Okay. Sure, thank you. Okay. I think the committee will receive evidence from SIA in the near future as well, and I, I am confident that we can create a way forward for completion of examinations. I think there are. Or may, I think on, more I, urgent I, considerations. May, I think well, there's, there's major challenges with examinations and indeed a lot of other things. The broad educational issues, I think, are ultimately solvable. They're not may not be done in as perfect a way as they're able to be done, but I think they are solvable. I think the bigger issues, as well as a number of members have said, is actually where we see the impact in terms of the health side. Yeah. Mm. Um, can I check? Karen Mullen, Deputy Chair, would you like to come back in briefly, and, and Justin McNulty as well, if we can keep our, our closing that, remarks brief. Yeah, just on that final point, um, I have been told on, on Monday there was a third of children who weren't attending school, and we're hearing that, that we expect that the rise in terms of parents voting with their feet. Uh, these are children who are at home with the man of without the educational provision. Mm -hmm. And I will now speak as a mower, not as a politician, trying to grab a headline. I have a 15-year-old daughter, and the more and more I hear, she will be staying at home because her health comes first. Um, what educational provision will be put in place for those children? Well, look, I think we want to work on an overall package in relation to that, and I think schools should be providing, even now, in terms of what is there, you know, uh, for pupils who will be at, at home. Indeed. While the scale is of a, a much greater level, it's not a unique situation on that basis. So, but I think we want to work to a situation where we get an overall package for everybody in, in that regard. Okay. But it will be on a school by school basis because yeah. school leaders and individual teachers are best placed to know what is appropriate for their classes mm -hmm. and what facilities are available. Um, but schools have already been doing excellent planning in that regard yeah. within the constraints yeah, they within which they are operating, yeah. of course. Thank you. Okay, Justin, briefly. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Just very quickly, why is the civil contingency group only meeting now? Did you not see this coming? No, I think. Look, I think there's been ongoing work between uh, departments. This is not the first meeting today. There's been other meetings. Certainly, was meeting last week. Uh, the point I was making in terms of that is meeting at present. All departments are represented. Um, had. The Education Committee not been sitting, Derek and myself would have been at that, but we have senior officials uh, from the department uh, at that. It met last week too, by the way. Just last week, okay. first time. When was the first time they met? I think it met on Thursday mm -hmm. as a civil contingencies group for the first time. Okay. But that's not, that's not to say that while it may not met in that format, that there's been ongoing discussions between different departments oh, yeah. and, and arm's length bodies. And I think, look, We've all found with this that, that uh, part of the problem with this is the speed of change in terms of the, uh, the coronavirus has been a challenge probably to everybody in, in public life, not just here, but in, in different parts of the, the world. Okay, a couple of closing questions. Minister, first, um, are you assured that there are adequate materials? For example, hand wash in all schools across Northern yeah. Ireland haven't asked them to remain open. We even, sorry. Yeah, we, yeah, we, we have. We've raised this in the. Yeah. Maybe let Derek. The, yeah, the, the education authority. We raised this as recently, well, earlier this week, and indeed yesterday. The education authority will ensure that all schools who need access to such materials will get them. Can I ask you to double check that? I will. I, I'm receiving accounts of schools very close to home that may need assistance in That's relation okay. to future supplies of um, materials to ensure hygiene in all schools, and I, I would be grateful for your follow-up. No, we, we, we'll do a follow-up. And I, I would say as well, I mean, if there, we'll, we'll follow up on both the general issue, but also if there are issues around specific schools, particularly on that, that issue, if, again, if you get them to, we will pursue okay. up directly with okay. the EA as well. It, just very briefly. briefly. Just breaking from Westminster, only MPs listed in the order paper will be allowed into the Commons Chamber. So we're saying only MPs on the order paper will be allowed into the Commons Chamber, but we're saying school children go back to school. Well, generally speaking, Justin, MPs don't require a parent uh, who's in the frontline medical service to be able to look after them. So I mean, yeah. there are degree of differences sure. in, in, okay. in connection with that. I'm going to try and help you get the clues here, Minister. Um, you, to, to just see as much clarity as we can in closing. You've said that schools will close. You yep. can't say when. You say that 
it is on conditions. Can you say what those conditions no, I, are? Look, I, I think you know, there will be work to try and get a, a broader situation where there can be uh, clear agreement um, on that. I think, as I said, it's a fluid situation. The conditions are that that, um, that, that is um, supported by clear medical advice in that regard. I think you know, I'm not going to jump into a position which is, is outside that, that medical advice. So anything will be done will be compatible with Okay. Um, that, that okay. Well, in class. terms of terms of closing remarks from myself, then um, personal responsibility, a united approach, and yeah. clear messaging has been cited as absolutely vital to help us protect as many people as we can from the worst effects of this virus. Um, it it's irrefutable that there are hundreds of schools across Northern Ireland today unable to or decided not to accept your messaging on this matter. That, that's just observable fact. I, I don't doubt your sincerity and integrity or commitment to protect staff and pupils, but as of today, you're asking school leaders and parents to respond to an increasingly unacceptable and untenable situation in our schools. There is significant confusion and concern, and I do think you need to establish urgently a date for school closure and to set out a much clearer plan for the wide range of contingency provision that is going to be necessary. Chair, look, I, I entirely take on board what, what you've said. As I said, um, actions will, that will be compatible with um, the broader uh, medical advice that is, that is there will be followed. I think, as with all these things, any, of, any actions that any of us take will be in their nature imperfect on that basis, but if, if any of us, in whatever shape or form, can make our contribution to trying to reduce the impact of this, you know, even you know, even if it means like in, in any case that, that any action that any of us take that helps save a single life, I think is something that would be worthwhile. So, okay. you know, from that point of view, uh, I can only go on the best advice that, that I can get in relation to it. I think it's important that as we chart a way ahead, I completely agree that as we chart a way ahead, the more certainty that's there and the more that we can actually phase timing in relation to this to um, indicate, as I said, uh, where there can be then dates for the, the closures. It will be on the, the basis of uh, a point at which schools will not be um, taking in pupils and then uh, a period where there can be some additional level of preparation for, for staff in that regard. Okay. And as I said, with, I think as part of any picture, will have to be also the impact that we have on the frontline medical staff, and there will be a bit of work done to try to ensure uh, that, um, as you say, frontline emergency staff, uh, there will be work done to ensure that there's provisions, along with all the other issues that have been raised, are, are done as best they possibly can. Yeah, mention was made earlier to uh, a COVID-19 emergency bill. If you need this uh, committee to reconvene at urgent notice, we give you our full commitment to reconvene uh, and as, I, as quickly appreciate as we that. I mean, I think yeah. the, the issue will just be in terms of enactment, um, and obviously there will be discussions between the Executive and the, the Assembly, you know, whether well, that's by way of some form of uh, legislative consent motion, you know, because I think the issue is, I think the, the bill itself covers, while obviously our focus is on the education side of it, it covers actually things which will involve each of the departments, and some will be quite departmental specific, and some will be more generic in their in their nature. So I, I suspect it's probably more likely to be taken, and I very much appreciate the offer um, that if there's anything needed, and if there's any additional briefing that we need to give, yep. not, I'm sure we can officials can do that. Conscious, we've rescheduled the response to the systemic failure in EA with regards to special educational needs provision. We'll return to that as soon as, okay. as possible. Okay. And I, I would ask you as Minister to give particular consideration to the additionally high concern and confusion that is apparent within special schools at this moment. No, I, look, I'm, I'm acutely aware of that and working with PHA directly on that. I think if there's, if there's something to be announced in a wider context, that's the preferable route. If that's not able to be possible, then something very specific, I think, would be uh, announced in relation to um, vulnerable children. Okay. Minister, Permanent Secretary, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. <coughs> I'll first ask the clerk if there's a need to summarise any actions or content to move to our next agenda item. So, Chairperson, um, members will keep me right here in terms of going forward. Perhaps the committee wants to write to the department.